of God in our lives, and we've uh, explored what it looks like for that call to salvation, what it looks like our individual call to God in ministry, and what it looks like to be a part of the collective call of God, the seasons that we are called to in life. And as this church is going to be making a decision to bring in a new pastor, we're beginning to look at what does it look like for our church to to understand what do we look for in a pastor. And we looked last week um, at the beginning of that, looking at the character. And today we're going to look at the giftedness, the skills that are needed when we're looking for a pastor. So join with me as we look in Acts chapter 6 and then verse Peter 5 this morning. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you serving as overseers not by compulsion but willingly not for dishonest gain but eagerly nor as being lords over those entrusted to you but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together as your people, to acknowledge you, to worship you, to praise you. Lord, we just ask that we will come this morning with hearts that are open to listen and that want to be obedient. And Lord, we pray that we will have an encounter with you that will impact and change our life. And Lord, that you would use us to grow your kingdom. And Lord, we pray if there's anyone here today who has never come to that place to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that this morning they would place their faith in you. And we ask that you would do this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In the age of what we call the CEO pastor, there's many churches that look to follow business principles in order to be able to make a large ministry. And there is the assumption if something works and it grows it, then it must be good. Pragmatism has become so popular that it's close to moral relativism. Success may be a good means of measuring what is considered good and right. And in a world even where Christians are often motivated by the flesh instead of the spirit, we must be wise people and have a healthy suspicion of examining what a pastor does and is it godly or is it pragmatism. We must be willing to question not just the ends, but also the means. Sadly, many go with, if it works and it's growing, then it must be good. 
But as Christians, we realize that the ends don't always justify the means. Today, there's many successful ministries. Some of the largest churches in America today go after what is called the prosperity gospel. There's many churches today that are more concerned about electing a politician than they are about winning people to Jesus Christ. There there are many churches today that are trying to change what it is to be a disciple of God. And it is about, why don't you come here and let us entertain you? And if you will just say a prayer and occasionally put something in an offering plate... We will celebrate where you are doing because that is enough compared to what the rest of the world is doing. But we need to be careful that when we're selecting a pastor, that we are following one who is called to do what the Bible instructs a pastor to do. Last week, we looked at the qualifications that were given scripturally for a pastor, and we looked at the most important criteria, and that was a pastor's character. And it cannot be overstated that the most important job of a search committee is to be able to look at a pastor more than what he does, but who he is. What is his relationship with Christ like? What is the maturity of the fruit that is being born in his life? And are the scriptural qualifications flowing out of him that we looked at last week in Timothy and Titus? And we must understand that those are more important than his preaching style or the current side of his his church or whether he is tall, dark, and handsome. But we also must realize that there are certain giftedness, there are certain skills that a pastor needs to have in order to be able to perform the function of which he is called. And today we're going to look at five of the key roles that are important for a pastor to be able to have, to be able to lead a church. As we do that, I want us to review last week as we look at the three terms that are used for the office of a pastor. When we see the word pastor, we see that that refers to being a shepherd, one who is taking care of the flock. One, as we remember Peter was told, to feed the flock and to tend the sheep. One who is protecting them from the wolves and the false prophets. One who is looking over the flock. And then two was the word elder. We looked at that that means that the pastor must be an example. He must be one of maturity. He has to be growing in the faith and and able to look at the fruit of his life so that he can help others be able to get there. And so he is setting the example. He's not just preaching it, he's actually living it. And then we saw the word overseer, which talks about being a supervisor. He is one who is administrating over the church. He is the one to, to help lead and make sure it stays on track and on vision. And today I want us to look at five key areas that the scripture lays out that a pastor, the one who holds this office, needs to follow. And the first I want you to see is that they must be able to teach the word of God. We saw a list of qualifications that were given that talked about the character of the individual that can be a pastor. And we looked at that office last week and and what that man of God must have as far as who he is. But it's interesting that one of the characteristics that was listed was they must have the ability to teach. Notice in 1 Timothy 3.2, it says a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, 
hospitable, able to teach. And it's interesting as we look in the passage that we just saw in Acts, as it talks about the function of this role of pastor, that it says in Acts chapter 6, Therefore, brethren, seek out among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And so when we look at this ministry of the Word and the teaching of the Word, we have to understand that for a pastor, that will be multifaceted. The pastor must be able to counsel individuals one-on-one. They must be able to teach the Word of God and be able to make application to their lives. They must be able to teach in a classroom setting because sometimes they're going to be training leaders or they're going to be teaching Bible studies or maybe Adam's going to ask them to lead a breakout session at a Youth for Christ conference and they're going to be in a classroom setting and they're going to have to be able to teach. But we also know that part of teaching is being able to preach, to passionately communicate God's truth and bring revelation application to the hearer. Now, let's be honest, there's different ways to preach. Some are more quiet and and more of a teaching style. Others are a little bit more loud and animated. There's some pastors who use alliteration. There's some who use object lessons. Can I tell you that there's not necessarily a right way Many times we just have preferences. There's different strokes for different folks because it reaches different people and God makes people different and that's okay, amen? But I do believe that when you're looking to choose a pastor, it is important that you find a man of God who does not teach topically, but teaches expositorily from God's Word. And what does I mean by that is is not that they come up with their own ideas and what they want to say and they write a sermon and then they go to Scripture and then they say, okay, I'm going to tell you what I say and I just use the Scripture to back up what I believe. But what they do is they're working through books of the Bible like we have done over the 16 years that I have been here. And and we look and, and we say, this is what God's Word says. And this is what God's words mean, and this is how we apply it to our lives. Verse by verse, book by book. There are men of God who preach from the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're able to teach from the law, the wisdom literature, the prophets, the gospels, the letters to the churches. They want and desire to preach the whole counsel of God. Because that way they will not avoid the truths of the scriptures that we all need to hear and to be able to grow. And you must make sure the person who fills this pulpit believes the word of God and is not ashamed to proclaim its truth. They must believe that it is the spirit of God that takes the word of God that changes their life. And it's not their skill level in speaking that is able to bring people to the Lord. It is only the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of the preaching of His Word. They must know the Word of God. And they must know doctrine. And they must be able to teach it. Titus 1.9 says this, They must hold fast the faithful Word as they have been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. They, they, They must not be people who later in life begin to teach new things or or change things, or or feel like they have to go with what culture is saying, but they know God's word, they believe God's word, and they teach and live God's word. A recent survey 
of a thousand pastors in America done by George Bond and the Arizona Christian University done in February and March of this year had some surprising results of the American church and where pastors are today. In that survey, they found that only 51% of evangelical churches, pastors, had a Christian worldview. Now folks, when we talk about an evangelical church, we would talk about one that we would consider one that believes the gospel and is conservative, that believes the Bible, and what they found was that only 51% of those pastors in those churches actually held to a Christian worldview. And when they brought in all the other churches, which included liberal churches, it dropped down to 37% of pastors. The majority of pastors in the churches in America don't even have a biblical worldview. And I warn you and I caution you, do not rush and make a decision in haste in bringing the next person to fill this pulpit. You must take your time and make sure you thoroughly examine and know this person and what they believe. When looking at Baptist churches in this survey, they found that only 48%, less than half, of Baptist pastors had a biblical worldview. Fortunately, the Southern Baptists did a little bit better. They were higher at 78%. But folks, that still means that one out of every four of them do not have a Christian biblical worldview. And it is important that you take the time and thoroughly examine and ask the hard questions that you make sure that this man of God defends the biblical worldview and is able to defend it through Scripture. In this survey, one-third of pastors said that the Holy Spirit was not a person, but a symbol of God's power. 39% of evangelical pastors, again, we're talking about people who we would consider those who would teach the true gospel, those who would be conservative. 39% of those pastors said there is no absolute moral truth and that each individual must determine their own truth. 38% of evangelical pastors would not affirm that human life is sacred. And 33% said that reincarnation is possible. A third of all senior pastors in this survey believe that sexual relations between two unmarried people who believed that they loved each other was morally acceptable. A third of them believe that the Bible is ambiguous when it comes to teaching on abortion. And that socialism is preferable to capitalism. Folks, there are many wolves in sheep clothing. There are many false prophets out there. You have a responsibility to make sure that you make sure that you make sure that you have a man of God who believes the word of God and that this is God breathed. That this is the infallible and errant word of God. And that this truth must be boldly preached because it brings us to the source of life and that is Jesus Christ. Secondly, we see when we're talking about the warning of finding a pastor who, who preaches the word of God, that it says in 2 Timothy 4.2, we see that Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, 
Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, and with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And folks, there are many men of God supposedly use that term, who are filling pulpits today. And what they're trying to be is man-pleasers and culture-pleasers. And what you must have is you must have a man of God who is willing to come and preach the love of God, but must also preach the repentance of sin. That they must come and they must teach That the gospel is simply believing in Jesus. But they must also preach that to reject that means that you will spend an eternity in hell. You must make sure that you bring someone who will not tickle ears, but will preach the Word of God. Not only do we see the talk about the ministry of the Word, but we also see... That the second thing that Acts mentions is that this man must be a prayer warrior. That the pastor must be proficient in prayer. He honestly must be a man who leads the church in this vital ministry of praying. And folks, to be honest, most churches today are looking for somebody who is gifted in marketing. They're looking at somebody who is gifted in being able to make sure they can bring the right lights and the right smoke on the stage and be able to be gifted in uh, radio ministry and TV ministry. Folks, the, the Bible says what you need to do is find a man who spends time on his knees praying for the church. A man who will burden the elders that their responsibility is to be men of prayer. More than men meeting in business meetings, the elders need to be leading in praying for the church. He must encourage the lay leaders, the staff, and the whole entire church to realize that if the power of God is going to be unleashed, then the only way that that does is, as the Bible says, that the people of God come and call upon the name of God. And if he's not a man of prayer, then he won't lead the church to be as well. And what you'll have is a ministry that is done in the flesh instead of the Spirit of God. Folks, let's be honest. Prayer is a struggle. And that's because it's a spiritual battle. It's not meant to be easy. And prayer is not just us sharing our life with God, but it's learning how to bring down strongholds and to be able to fight against Satan and his schemes. It's about birthing the plan of God and the vision that he has. We read this in James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And again he prayed, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, if you have an opportunity, you can go look in 1 Kings chapter 18. You get to read this story about Elijah praying. And I love this story because God comes to Elijah and he says, listen, there's going to be this drought that's going to take place. And the drought takes place. And then he comes to Elijah and says, Elijah is going to rain. 
And so we know the story of when he goes up onto Mount Carmel and he has the, the battle with the false prophets. And we know that he builds the altar, fire comes down from heaven, 850 of the false prophets end up being killed. And then what's interesting is that Elijah goes after God told him that it was going to rain and he goes and he prays on that mountain. And he goes up to, and, and as he's praying, he tells his servant, I want you to go and tell me when you see the cloud coming. And it's interesting that it says that, that, that Elijah's on his knees with his head in between his knees. And what it's talking about is literally that he was getting in the birthing position at that time of how a, a woman would give birth. And, and in essence, he understood that prayer was birthing God's plan. Now, God had already told him to reign. It was coming. But Elijah knew this, that his responsibility was to pray for rain. And how many times, church, do, do we know that God wants to do something, but we just simply won't get together and pray and keep praying until it happens? And, and so he was praying, and he say, go look and tell me if it's raining. And the guy would go up there and look, and it wasn't. And then he'd come back, said, no. And then he kept on praying, and he said, go look, seven times. And the seventh time, the guy looks and he says, Oh, Elijah, there, 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 there's a small cloud. That's like the hand of a, just the size of the fist of a man. And he said, the rain's coming, let's go. Folks, if you're ever going to see a movement of God, if you're ever going to see the plan of God birth, it's going to have to be from prayer and you're going to have to have a man of God who comes and he prays. And you're going to have to be a congregation that's willing to pray. And you need to have a man who will challenge you and teach you how to pray. The two most important ministries is the teaching of God's word and prayer. But third, we see in Scripture that the pastor must also be a vision caster. We see that he is the bishop. He is the overseer. And, and, and the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who keeps the law. And this is why it's so important for a pastor to have a quality prayer life because you, what you do not want is for a pastor to implement his vision for the church. What you want is for a man of God to pray and hear from God and know God's vision for the church and implement God's vision. For the church. But it is important for the bishop, the overseer, the supervisor. To be the one that knows the vision of the church and able to communicate it. He has to know where the church is headed. Because if he does not, believe me, there are plenty of other people who will step in his place and take the church somewhere. And so, when you're asking this pastor, what is the vision? Where, where do you sense God desires to take the church? He must be able to communicate that. Now listen, God gives the mission to the church. And that doesn't change. That's what we are. Love God, love others, reach the world. Who came up with that? Not us. That was Jesus Christ. Jesus said this was the greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart, and likewise, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, go into all the world and make disciples. That doesn't change. That is what every church should be about. 
But how that looks is going to be unique to the culture and the giftedness of the people of that church and the calling of that church. And, and God creates many different types of churches out there to reach different types of people. And there are many faithful churches out there who are preaching God's word, they're intentionally making disciples, and they're reaching their community for Christ. Some of them are biker churches, and they're reaching biker gangs. Some of them are ethnic churches, and they reach a certain ethnic culture. There's others that that seek to reach a, a certain age group that can't be reached and do a great job at that. But it's important that as you select a pastor, that you make sure that their vision and philosophy of ministry matches what are the key values in the direction of ministry that this church is going. And many times, this is where search committees make a mistake. Many times they select truly good and godly men who are very gifted communicators, but they have a different vision for what the church is than the vision that the church has for itself, and they end up clashing, and it ends up being not a very good fit, and it ends up tearing things apart instead of finding a person who is going to help this church be able to go on the vision and the key values that are important to it. And so a search committee must know the DNA of their church so that they make sure that when they bring someone, that they're bringing someone who aligns with where this church wants to go and minister. Let's say, for example, this pastor decides, you know what? I don't want to do a Sunday morning worship service. I want to do a Sunday evening worship instead. Is that wrong? Absolutely not. You know, if you go to Belize, almost all the worship services are held Sunday night. But would that be a cultural problem for this congregation? Would that be something that would go against the DNA of who you are? If it is, then you need to make sure. Or or what about the small group ministry? Is it important for you to continue to to have the small groups where you are relational? You know, if you don't have a a pastor who sees that and they say, well, you know what, we're going to get rid of the small group ministry. Instead, we're just going to do a potluck once a month to let everybody get to know each other. Is that wrong? Absolutely not. Or maybe they say, you know what, we want to change the small groups. And instead of being relational, we just want to make them really in-depth inductive Bible studies. Is that wrong? No, but could it be something that would cause friction in who you are? And so it's important that as you analyze and understand who you are, that you bring a person in who God has prepared and their vision will be able to match the direction in which the church desires to go. Aubrey Malfers, who is a church planner expert and a growth leader, growth church growth expert, said that one of the major spiritual gifts that is lacking in most senior pastors today is the gift of leadership. And that's a spiritual gift that is given in the church. And I would encourage you to make sure that when you are bringing in the next senior pastor for this church, the next lead pastor, that you would make sure that this pastor has the gift of leadership. That they're able to communicate vision and no vision, and they're able to, to be able to direct the path in which this church is to go. But make sure you bring the pastor who knows the vision of this church and is going to help it to go in the vis- vi- direction that you feel called. The fourth thing I want you to see is that the pastor must be an equipper of leaders. 
And the lead pastor is not to do the ministry of the church, but to equip the church for ministry. Notice what it says in Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he himself gave himself to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ. The pastor must spend time developing leaders in order to be able to fulfill the ministry of the church. It is not the responsibility of the pastor to do the ministry of the church. It's not the responsibility of the staff to do the ministry of the church. It's not the responsibility of the elders to do the ministry of the church. Amen? The church is to do the ministry of the church. And the responsibility of bringing a pastor is to equip. And the way a pastor does that is he must spend time equipping leaders. He must spend time equipping the elders and equipping the staff and equipping small group leaders and DOMs. He must be skilled in getting to know the new members of the congregation so that he can discover their spiritual gifts and figure out where they will fit in. He must be one who not only trains well and teaches well, but he must be one who also models that. He doesn't just tell people what to do, but he shows them what to do. If you look at Jesus' example of how he made disciples, Jesus would teach them, and then he would go out and do it, and then he would send them out to go do it, and then he'd bring them back and evaluate and do it again, and you must find a man of God who is able to be able to set that model and grow other people. And then he must be one who is a good delegator. He can't do everything. He can't be hands-on in everything. And so this man must be able to raise up leaders and to be able to develop leaders and then be able to entrust leaders. He's still responsible. He's still given oversight. He realizes the buck must stop here. But he is raising up men and women of God and trusting them in doing the ministry that God has called them to do. And make sure that they're staying on task to be able to fulfill the vision of what the church is supposed to be doing. You know, many times ministries can get sidetracked and they're good ministries. You know, that's one of the reasons we don't do Awana anymore at our church. It's not that Awana is a bad ministry. It's that in our church, we had a purpose for Awana on Wednesday nights, and that was to be able to reach unchurched kids and to be able to let them know who Jesus was. And we found that at the beginning that was working, but over the years as we evaluated it, we realized that as we were doing Awana, the people who were coming were either our kids or they were other kids that went to other churches. And we realized that although Awana is a good program, it's not fulfilling the vision of what we were supposed to be doing. So we got rid of that program and now we have Grace Kids Rec. And now the majority of the kids who are coming on a Wednesday night are unchurched kids. And we want to be able to share with them who Jesus is. And it's important that the pastor is able to help, be able to guide and direct and make sure that the church stays on vision and not just run programs forever and ever, amen? But it's actually accomplishing. And the way they do that is they equip leaders who will help fulfill that vision and make it a reality. And then finally, we see that the pastor must have the heart of an evangelist. What do we mean by being an evangelist? 
It means that the pastor must be able to communicate and regularly communicate in their individual life. They must make sure that every ministry is about evangelism, reaching the lost. And and, and they must make sure that from the pulpit that they are always sharing the gospel. Every Sunday you must hear that, that Jesus Christ died for your sins. That there is no way that you can have eternal life. There is no way that you can be forgiven by God except that Jesus Christ came, God in flesh, and died on your behalf and my behalf, and He paid for the penalty of sin, which is death. The wages of sin is death. And what did Jesus do? He died on the cross and paid the penalty. But three days later, He rose again from the dead and He gives life. And the only way to receive salvation is by receiving it as a gift through faith. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't pay for it. But if you're willing to believe and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Now, the pastor doesn't need to have to be the next Billy Graham. But let me be honest. If your pastor does not have a heart to reach the lost, then the church will not either. And there's many churches that are okay trying to grow by what's called family growth. And they just encourage, hey, y'all have a bunch of kids and we'll grow. There's churches that are fine saying, look, we're going to try to have the best programs so that we can steal all the other people who are dissatisfied with their churches. And so they grow by getting sheep to come along from other churches. But what God desires is conversion growth. He desires to see men and women and children and youth who don't have a relationship with God to come and learn about Him and to turn from their sin and to find this new life and to be born again. You must have a pastor who's intentional about building relationships outside of the church and also inside the church for the direct purpose to lead people to Jesus. They have to be able to to be involved in helping new believers grow and to learn spiritual disciplines. And they must stir the church up to be able to go and do evangelism. And out of the heart for evangelism will be the heart for missions. To not only reach this community for Christ, but to reach the world. Jesus said this, I came to seek And to save the lost. And the lead pastor must have the same passion and push the congregation to go into the harvest. This is what Paul told Timothy. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And if you're not having a pastor who's doing an evangelism, if you're not stirring the waters of the baptism, if you're not bringing new people to Christ, then you're not fulfilling your ministry. Folks, I challenge our staff all the time. I tell our children's ministry. I tell our youth ministry. I tell our DOMs, whether you're in prime time or whether you're in max or whether you're young adults, whether you're in your music ministry or, or, or whether you're in hospitality ministry, it doesn't really matter. In every single ministry, we need to always be sensitive that there could be lost people around and we need to always be communicating the gospel because we never know when could be the last time that person hears. But sadly, there's many pastors that don't have that heart. 
In that same survey that I was referencing earlier, it found that one-third of pastors said that you could earn your place in heaven by simply being a good person. One-third of pastors in the United States believe that it is possible to get to heaven through your own self-goodness, your own self-righteousness. And 37% of evangelical pastors said that having faith is more important than in what or whom you have faith in. God, there, there's, there's this new movement that's out there that just says, I'm a person of faith. Faith in what? Unless you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it will not save you. It's not enough just to have faith. It's what your faith is in. And 30% of evangelical pastors could not affirm that their salvation was based on their confessing of their sins and accepting Jesus as their Savior. Folks, you must make sure that the next man of God has a heart for the lost. It was interesting in this survey, they found that those who did not have regular spiritual routines were the ones who did not have biblical beliefs. But those men of God who read the Bible and prayed and worshiped and confessed their sin, they were the ones more likely to have beliefs that ended up with a Christian worldview. And Jesus said this, Follow me and I will what? Make you fishers of men. And you must make sure that the next pastor of this church is following Jesus. That he's regular in the word. That he's a man of prayer that he's seeking to grow, and what will be the evidence that it will have the same heart as Jesus to seek and save the lost, that he will be a fisher of men. Folks, you must be very, very careful because there's a big buzzword in Christianity today, and there's a lot who say, well, you know what? I'm not about evangelism as a pastor. I'm about discipleship. And if you hear that, don't bring that person in. Because a lot of times what that means is what I'm about is just growing people and they figure that what growing means is I'm about Bible study and prayer. Folks, if you're growing in the Bible and you're following Jesus, you're to become fishers of men. If you're growing in the Bible in prayer, you're going to have a heart like Jesus. If you're becoming in His image, then you're going to desire to seek and save the lost. If you're about discipleship, you will be about evangelism. If you're truly about evangelism, you're going to be about discipleship. In the Bible, they're not separated. Jesus said, if you make disciples, then you have to teach them everything and that, that they need to do. Now, there's so many out there today in Christianity that are serving in past pastors that believe that it's okay just to be satisfied in teaching the Bible and doing things, but they don't care anything about the lost world that is dying and going to hell. Folks, let me tell you, there's no way that you can be drawing closer to Jesus and not care about lost people. Because that's why he came. 
because you and I were lost. And he loved us. And if we're drawing closer to him, then that's what we're going to care about too. And we must have a pastor that will always challenge you to reach this community and the world for the gospel. So while there's many dangers out there, there are men of God who have the character and who have these five characteristics. Begin praying that God would bring the right man to lead Grace Baptist. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your truth and your word, and I just pray, Lord, that today that you would hear the prayers of this congregation as we get ready to enter into a time of prayer, that you would begin to prepare the next man of God to come and to lead this church. And that he would be a man who believes your word, is unashamed of your word, preaches your word in the power of the Holy Spirit, is not concerned about whether people like him, but is concerned about being faithful to you and bringing you glory. That he'll be a man who, who prays. And Lord, that he'll be a man who teaches his congregations to pray and he'll challenge the leaders of this church not to do ministry unless they pray. Lord, that he'll be a man of vision that comes from you and he'll communicate that. That he'll make sure that the church stays on track and that he'll be a man of God who equips leaders to be able to do the ministry of the church so that it'll grow, that he won't seek to do it all, but that he'll raise up and gift others. And Lord, that he'll have a heart. Lord, that he'll preach the gospel every week that people will come to know Jesus not only from his preaching but from him getting out in the community and meeting people that he'll set that example and that others in this church will follow and that many will come to know Jesus and Lord we just pray today if there's anyone here who has never believed that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and that you rose again to give them eternal life, that they would understand that there is no way that they can get to be with you, Father, unless they receive this gift. And this morning, that they would just simply say, Jesus, I'm ready to give my life to follow you. I'm ready to turn from my sin and repent. Because, Lord, I understand that if I don't, I will spend an eternity apart from you in hell. But Lord, I believe that you came and you died and you rose again to give me life. And today I'm receiving that gift. And I'm going to live in gratitude for what you've given me. Lord, we pray that you would do a great work over the next few moments. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning and for the first time you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to do something that's going to take some courage, but as we stand and sing that you would come and let me know, I want to be able to give you some information to help you grow in that love relationship with Jesus. Or maybe you have questions about that, and I'd love to talk to you this morning. But this morning as we stand and sing, the altar will be open for prayer. Today, church, would you come and begin to pray that God would send the next pastor of grace who has the right character and the right skills that we need. As the Lord speaks, will you obey? Let's stand and sing. I need the every hour most gracious Lord no tender voice like thine can be Suffer. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art.
that in our worship service, we structured in a way that we, we get to pray, time of prayer of what we just heard for the preaching of the word and how God has been moving and speaking. I hope you've been able to pray and join together in this next man of God that he has in store for Grace Baptist. Hope that you continue those prayers as well um, than beyond just this time. One of the things that came to my mind during the, the sermon was this idea of the priesthood of all believers. Um, Pastor Andy spent a lot of time talking about this particular qualifications for the role of pastor. Um, but we understand on, on some level that we all have this responsibility of sharing the gospel, right, of being men and women of character and um, that use uh, the, the passions that God gives us um, to encourage one another to see each other equipped for the work of God. So um, I'm encouraged. I, I hope you are encouraged as well to continue to grow, continue to be all that God would have us be. Uh, connection card time. If you are a visitor with us this morning or maybe um, a, a second time visitor, you've been here before, but you haven't been able to um, pass along your information, this connection card is a great tool that we have for us to connect with you. Um, I've done some follow-up phone calls even this week and invited people to new members class just to connect people that have come and visit. Some are passing through. Others are looking for a church home. Um, so we want you to feel welcomed and encourage you to fill out that information. Let us know a little bit about you. And uh, also come. There's a gift at our new members. Um, I'm sorry, a gift at our Connection Center in the lobby that we have for you, too. On the back side of the connection card, this is for everyone. It's a spot for prayer and praises. Uh, we can continue to join in praying with you through what you're going through, uh, any challenges, any joys that you want to celebrate. We want to celebrate together. Thanks for taking the time to, to fill that out. You can drop the actual hard copies on both sides of the sound booth, or if you'd like to fill that out online, there is a QR code to help you do that. Uh, I think Pastor Andy just has a few more announcements. I'll pass it back to him. 
Thank you, Jared. Uh, if you look in your bulletin, just want to bring a few things to your attention. Um, you can uh, see that after the service today, there's going to be a business meeting. And so we will uh, break just for you to be able to get your kids in preschool and then meet in about five minutes. And our new members, we want to encourage you to go to the fellowship center. Um, and we'll continue um, our new members class immediately after service. Um, and then I um, want to let you know that um, my farewell dinner will be on Saturday, November 5th. And the whole entire church is invited, but we would like for you to be able to sign up for that so that um, you can, so we can make sure that we have the right amount of food. And so all you have to do is simply text the word farewell or you can get in touch with Ashley and to, to be able to sign up for that. And then my last Sunday will be November 6th. And so um, next week we will be looking at, we've looked at the call of the pastor. Next week we're going to look at what is the call of the church to a pastor? And what can a church uh, do to, to be able to assist a pastor? And so I hope that you'll come next week um, as we look at that and uh, look forward to over the next few weeks uh, being able to spend time with you and to be able to fellowship together. Um, I'm sort of ending the day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities, beginning to delegate that and hand that off. So um, I am free to, to be able to meet with some of you if you would like and to, to be able to go have coffee or something like that. And um, just want you to know that I'm still here over the next few weeks and uh, looking forward to finishing strong and uh, we're excited about what God has for grace um, in the next season of its ministry. And uh, we had, how many people did we have today and new members? I had a dozen uh, in our new member class. So God's doing a great work and we want to praise him for that. One of the other great works that God did recently was at our women's retreat. And our ladies uh, went to Hume Lake and had an awesome time. And we want to close um, the service today by looking at a video of uh, the retreat um, that they just went to.
believe every breath we could ever breathe. We lift the earth. Oh, we lift the earth. You holy name. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show So ladies, I hope that if you didn't weren't able to make it this year, that you'll plan on being there next year. It's a great time to be able to just get away and grow in your own relationship with God and grow with the ladies in this church. And um, with that, let's stand and let's close in a word of prayer again. Remember to pick up your children if you have preschoolers and children, come back if you're a member. And then those who are in our new members class, if you're headed to the fellowship hall, We'll, we'll get started in just a little bit to finish um, your study. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for the time that we can come together. We're excited about, Lord, how you're leading this church and growing this church. And Lord, we just uh, come before you. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for communicating to us, Lord, the, the character and the skills that are needed, Lord, to be able to lead Grace Baptist. And we just pray that, Lord, is we're praying even now that you would burden the heart of this man and his family, Lord, to be the next leader here. And, and Lord, that they would have a wonderful season and productiveness to be able to reach this community and to use these people to reach different parts of this world and loving God and loving others and reaching the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.